Welcome to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And this week, we have a spectacular show for you. We are going to be talking about all the news from WWDC that matters for the IoT. We are going to be talking about Madam A, Amazon's digital assistant, getting on PCs. We've got a smart sensor Kickstarter project that may be worth a look. We've got updates on Microsoft. They have got this great smart building software they've introduced. And... Kevin and I have been purchasing gadgets and applications that you may find useful. So our guest this week, we're taking things to a little artistic level. She is Anya Trabala with Synth Babe Records, and she's going to talk to us about bringing IoT into musical performances. We also talk about VR, AR, and the blockchain, because you can't have a guest and not talk about the blockchain in 2018. So we've got all of this plus a message from our sponsor, Praetorian, and more. So let's kick it off with a message from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Bosch. Interested in all things IoT? The Bosch Connected World blog covers a wide range of IoT topics from around the world, such as Industry 4.0, mobility, smart home, blockchain, and ag tech. Check out blog.bosch.com hyphen si.com for articles, case studies, interviews, and more. I read this blog on the regular and I will tell you guys, I love it. It has some very useful case studies and think thought processes on IoT. This is not a typical corporate rah-rah blog at all. Highly good. Okay, Kevin, you, <laughs> <laughs> you watched all of WWDC. I kind of had it going on in the background while I did some other work. So we're going to rely on your take for most of this. So let's talk about the biggest news from this. I was disappointed, frankly. Frankly, I was too, not just because I invested about two hours and 15 minutes waiting for something really exciting. But when they finally got to talk about Siri and HomeKit, yeah, it was a little bit of a letdown. Granted, this is their developer event, they being Apple. So they focused on software this time around. No new hardware whatsoever. Talked about iOS, OS 10, tvOS, and what was it? Oh, watchOS. Watch I, for- I almost forgot about that. I was that. like, and you I have wear- one. I wear that every waking moment. Yes, I forgot about that. But HomePod was only mentioned one time in passing, first of all. So there's nothing to say there. And Siri. Yes, they did talk about Siri. And I wrote up my thoughts on the blog and I said she got smarter, but not in the way you might have thought or maybe had hoped. There's still a knowledge gap there between Siri and the offerings from Amazon and Google. I don't see much of a step forward there, maybe half a step forward. It was more about the usefulness of Siri in your everyday life, which is good. They introduced, this was the big feature, was shortcuts. And If you're familiar with If This Then That, it's very similar to shortcuts. What you can do is you can record a trigger phrase for Siri, and when you say that phrase, you can actually configure Siri to do any number of things using various apps and services on your phone, which is kind of cool. The demo was kind of neat, where the woman on stage said, heading home, and she had pre-configured that phrase to fire up Apple Maps and find the quickest way home and to send a message to everybody home saying I'm on my way home and fire up the radio station so she could listen to NPR on her phone in her car. It was one or two other things that she, oh, she set her home thermostat to 70 and and so on. Kind of cool. And again, reminds me of if this and that and also how HomeKit sets up the automations is very much a drag and drop kind of experience. This actually reminded me a lot of, this is actually something I've built using both Stringify and You Know Me plus Google Voice. Yes. So, yes. I mean, it's one extra software platform player, I guess, but, you know, being able to set these things up, you could actually do this yourself using any number of other options. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because do you want to know what the first thought I had was when I saw this? What was the first thought, Kevin? I recalled specific memories of setting up Microsoft voice command where you would record a voice command on a pocket PC in 2001 and you would configure that to do certain things. Granted, you couldn't do nearly the things that you can do today. Like back voice then. activated macros. That's exactly what they were. 
Yes. And I thought of that. And then the other thing I thought of was, shouldn't the assistant be learning and know what my habits are and just set the configuration up sort of for me, like surfaces at these kind of things. And to be fair, Siri will start doing more of that. They did show and discuss, you know, if you constantly go to the gym at 5 p.m. every day and you open a particular running app, like, which I do, not every day at 5, but whatever, eventually Siri will see that you are there. And before you even open the app, it'll say, hey, it looks like you're at the gym and you're ready to start your running app. And so it'll save you a tap or two. But I mean, it just felt weird because the assistants are supposed to be getting smarter. But in this case, you're teaching Siri to get smarter on your own. You have to configure it. And I wonder how many people are really going to take full advantage of this. How many Siri users? I don't think it's going to catch on where everybody's going to be using this who has an iPhone. I just I just don't see it. Yeah, I'm actually curious because like you can do this with routines or I think it's routines in Amazon's world and in Google's world. And I've set up a couple, but, you know, they're kind of a pain. (laughs) Yeah, that's the thing. The whole point of the assistant is it's supposed to do things for you. And, you know, this is kind of like programming your assistant in a very simple fashion, obviously, in a way that anybody can do. But you're absolutely right. These are like routines. And in fact, the one smart thing Apple has done here is the way you do this, you have to link your apps with Siri. And Siri hasn't worked tremendously well with a lot of third-party apps. So yay, Apple, for opening it up. And now you can link your apps. So that way, another stage demo was a can't find my keys shortcut where you say that. And because you linked Siri to a tile app, Siri would buzz the tile Bluetooth tracker for you and pop up the app actually for you. So that's good. But I don't know. In a sense, Apple is not going the Amazon or Google route with skills or actions and routines. It's just using apps for those purposes, I think. Yes. And a friend of mine who is a big supporter of Apple products, he pointed out that learning is really tough. And when you get it wrong, it irritates people. And that actually brought me back to, and I wrote about this, but seeing Google's head of connected speaker products, Mark Spates speak. And he talked about, you know, when you're doing an AI model, If you're doing it for what he called a corrective experience, so that's when a motion sensor doesn't detect motion for a while and it turns off the light automatically, it needs to have like an 85% confidence interval because it's really annoying when you like are sitting there in a room and you're like, ah, the lights went off, I'll wave my hands. And if you're actually going to start something like turn like I'm going home, turn on the oven or order a pizza, and it has real world implications that are kind of bigger than just waving your hands around, then you've got to have like five nines confidence interval, which is why mm-hmm. a lot of like people fight with their like learning thermostats. And and I can see, you know, Apple does not want to build Clippy, right? Right. So yeah, that makes sense. The only other aspect that our listeners might be interested in the apple home app which is typically on ios devices will also be available on mac os 10 this fall with os 10 mojave and that should be out well they just said fall i I suspect september ish the public beta will probably kick off soon so you'll be able to have home on your mac yay I Yay. Can, that means that I could actually play with this without, but you wouldn't get geofencing and all that, which, you know, unless you. No, no. You have Siri built into the Mac already, and then you would could gain that be access. Could your hub if your Mac was always plugged in? Well, that's a good question. They did not mention that. They didn't talk really about remote access and hubs and all that, which I was actually hoping for. I mean, they did have a whole Apple TV bit, and I was like, oh, please add some Zigbee or Z-Wave radios in a new version. And But they didn't discuss hubs at all. Okay, well. So that was what was new on WWDC. Yay. (laughs) That was very muted. I was like, eh, you know, I I know we weren't expecting a lot, but, you know, it's always nice when Apple blows your mind, right? Yeah. Uh, All right. So let's talk about, oh, HomeKit is coming to a computer near you, specifically a MacBook near you. And Madam A, Amazon's Echo Assistant, is coming to a PC near you. Kevin, what do you think? Do we need Madam A on a PC? Well, I think it's handy to have these assistants in and around us everywhere you can have in your home and such. To me, this is kind of a probably something Microsoft is not too happy about because they want Cortana in all their Windows machines. And they have a 
big partnership with Amazon. Exactly, exactly. But Amazon is taking a play out of Microsoft's playbook now because they work with three different ODMs or original design manufacturers of PCs, Compal, Quanta, and Wistron. They all create PCs for the HPs, the Dells, and so on. They build them. What they have is four actual Windows PCs that have Madam A built in. And this will let hardware makers just work with these designs and just have Madam A integrated automatically. There's nothing they'll have to do. So there's one PC and three laptops that will uh, hardware makers can choose from to build off of that will have Madam A. I mean, I think it's good. I just I don't think Microsoft's gonna be happy. Yeah, because they were trying to make this weird fine line that that I did originally think was strange between Madam A and Cortana. And Cortana was for business and Madam A was for home. But even figuring out what was what didn't make sense. So who knows? This would be a more native experience than the Cortana asking Madam A to do something, you know, one assistant asking another. So this would probably be a better Amazon experience, one would hope. I would hope, but we'll see. When are these due out? You know what? These are just, again, these are like design reference models. So it's going to be up to Acer, Asus, Lenovo, HP, Dell, etc. to decide if they're going to use these reference models or not. So I don't know if or when we'll see these. Got it. All right. And in the maybe more exciting world of crazy connected gadgets you can buy, you found a sensor that I'm kind of like, eh, I've seen it, but you thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, we have seen these type of sensors before. This is a Kickstarter project that has eight days to go. It's only halfway to its goal. And if it's not funded all the way, it's not happening. It's one of those all or nothings, which is actually good. If it doesn't happen, if you back it, you'll get your money back. This is called the Oval, and it's actually the second generation Oval. Basically, it's a small five-in-one sensor. It can measure or tell you about motion, light, temperature, water or humidity. There's no video camera, no microphone or anything like that. There's no subscription fees. You just kind of stick these anywhere you want. There's a little gateway device so these things can talk to each other. And before the show, Stacey and I were comparing pricing to something similar. I think it was the Notion you had said? Yes, it's the Notion sensors. They're a Colorado company. You can find them on Amazon or at their website, getnotion.com. And these have been out for a while. They're just circular sensors that, you know, they measure a bunch of different stuff, temperature, humidity, water. They don't measure light, but they have a decibel tracker so they can measure things like, you know, glass breaking and that sort of thing. Right. You know, if you already have a smart home setup, these are probably not for you. I would say these are, in fact, Oval's campaign is targeting apartment renters, Airbnb hosts, you know, roommates at college, maybe pricing isn't terrible. You can literally get one sensor and one gateway for 99 bucks. If you want two sensors, it's 129 and the price goes up from there. It was interesting to me. I mean, they they run on a coin cell battery, so you don't have to really worry about that for about six months. You just stick them anywhere you want. There's double-sided tape included, no subscription fees. There's an app for iOS and Android. You'll obviously get push notifications, but it can also send texts or even emails if you'd rather get notified of things that way. Integration-wise, currently only with If This Then That. They are looking at HomeKit certification, but they are saying up front, you know, it's kind of costly, so it may not happen. Got it. Okay. Yes. And Notion, the other, the sensor this most reminded me of, this is an Kevin, the one that Kevin found is an oval. Notion is a circle, but they do not have an IFT integration. They do work with Nest. So, you know, you can actually like detect temperature and then turn on your air conditioner. Yay. So that's where they are. Let's talk about kind of some fun little bits of news. We've got Lenovo Smart Display that Kevin and I are both really excited about. These are the Google Assistant Smart Displays. Sadly, while I can pre-order it now, it doesn't ship till September. Well, I'm going to make it even sadder because the link was working before the show, and now the page is down for pre-orders. Yeah! Sounds to me like, and this was B&H Photo. Oh, they always uh, do this. Yeah, it sounds to me like that went up a little early and they gave away the shipping date or rough estimation of when it will be available, which was September 3rd. So I don't know what the deal is, but we haven't heard squat about this thing shipping. Well, they this said the it would be out in the summer. So I well, guess technically, I uh, know it's right after Labor Day. Sure. It's summer. It's still summer. So, yeah. 
All right. And, you know, again, the holdup could be this is not just a standard smart display running on Android. Wasn't this, we later found out, Android things? Yes. That could be part of the issue. Let's I. All mm-hmm. right. Let's get businessy. Microsoft has new IoT core services that they announced. Woohoo. What are they, Kevin? This will make you happy because they already announced the IoT core product. So the services that they're announcing today provides 10 years of Windows OS support through the Windows long-term service channel. And obviously that means you'll have your devices will be supported for 10 years. But also, if you're using that release, you won't get feature updates. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because that will let you focus on stability if you're a device maker. So that's yes, good. And this is actually super important in the industrial world where patches yep. can break like everything. everything. And <laughs> if you're patching a piece of equipment that's like your manufacturing process is dependent on, you know, you're looking at millions, hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost revenue if your line goes down. I mean, this is For most of us in the consumer world, we're like, ah, patch away. I'd hate to have this. But a lot of these big industrial companies or enterprises that have got a lot of things set up on it, or if you're a medical device manufacturer and you don't want to like send an update to the FDA, this kind of stability is really important. Yep. And Microsoft gets it. This is why Azure Cloud is doing so well and Microsoft's IoT services are doing well. I wish that they had more customers to talk about. They still using the same reference customers. And Sam George at Microsoft had told me that this is partially because a lot of customers are trying things out. And if it works, it's so good for them that they don't want to share it. And if they're kind of like, eh, I don't know what to do with it yet, then they kind of stay in pilot purgatory forever. So I agree with you. But I did notice and I was very happy to see it that one of those customers using this is Missy Robotics. Yes, yes, they are. They were at Build, actually. That's where I talked to them the first time. Yeah. So, Two other things with this, the mm-hmm. core services. They It works with Microsoft's Device Update Center. So that way, it gives you a centralized way to control and, and send out updates as needed. You can even target a small group of devices for testing updates. So that's good. And then they have device health attestation. So you can enable the trustworthiness of a device at boot time for a trusted IoT system. So that is awesome. That is. Okay. Also from Redmond, Microsoft announced this week that they are, they don't have a name for this service yet, but we'll call it spatial intelligence. So understanding of where things are in a building. So they've released this. They actually showed off kind of a sense of this at Build a few weeks ago when they did a conference room demo and the conference room understood who was in the room based on their ID badge and kind of where other people were in the building. So that was pretty cool. This is the service that enables this, and it can do things like detect occupancy. It can understand if you have tags on furniture. It can understand what furnitures and what rooms and all kind of, and understand how people move around the building and interact with the space. This is going to freak a lot of people out. If your employer is like, hey, why aren't you in the office more? Or <laughs> <laughs> Why do you spend all your time at the bathroom or at the water cooler? That might, you know, you might be like, uh, well, but the goal is to understand how buildings are used, where stuff is. If an employer needs it, you know, you're like, ah, I need the paper cutter. Where is it? We had this issue in newsrooms, but I don't hmm. think people look for paper cutters anymore. <laughs> no, as a work from home person, I love this idea. Okay. Are well, because sar- it- are you being sarcastic? No, well, I'll never be monitored. Is my point? <laughs> oh, well, actually, so you used to have you used to have this idea when we were at GigaOM together, where you wanted to tie your chair, like your butt being in your chair, to your mm-hmm. IM status. Yeah, so people would know when I'm available and when I'm not. Yeah, so you can actually say, do yeah. something with this. I mean, yeah, no, no, I, that I, in, I was being facetious. There's a lot of cool applications for this, and, and when I was at Google, we worked on these smart office projects in spare time. This is very cool stuff. Yes. And current Um, customers using it are Steelcase mm -hmm. and CBRE Group, which is a huge CB Richard Ellis is what it used to be. But I guess now it's just a bunch of just a bunch of letters. So big real estate development company. I'm a little surprised and maybe they are using this, but I'm a little surprised that Microsoft seems to have abandoned all the technology that it acquired and invested in with the Xbox Connect. Yeah, so they actually, in the demo, and this was a big thing at Microsoft Build, they had, you know, where the Polycom speaker conference center was, they had this Mm -hmm. giant cone. And I wonder if the Kinect 
kind of hardware could be in the cone. Everyone was like, what's in the mm-hmm. cone? Nobody knows. So they may not have abandoned Connect, And we'll just have to see where it I mean, they would be silly not to incorporate some of that here. But, you know, Agreed. it does produce pretty high bandwidth kind of data. So true. They, maybe they, it's at a little point, too creepy. Maybe. I mean, they don't have to use all of the sensors, you know, the cameras and such um, to do what they need to do. I remember after I bought the Connect, they actually had an SDK, Connect SDK for Windows. And I was using it to kind of create a way to turn my lights on when I walked in my office, when the Connect saw me and whatnot. I mean, this this goes back quite a ways, actually. But all the pieces of the puzzle were there, you know. So maybe they're still using it. Who knows? Who knows? And finally, final little bit of news, Sierra Wireless has launched a new version of its Mango open source hardware platform for industrial IoT. And so the Mango Yellow is the new device. It is a super sensor. The Mango Yellow has 14 sensors and actuators on board, which is quite a bit. (laughs) Yeah. And it will function with a wide variety of cellular-based low-power wide area networks, such as CAT-M1 and NB-IoT. So this joins the Mango red and green products that are out there. And basically, it's just got more sensors. This is used by companies who want to try to build and prototype connected devices and business processes. So you can buy a couple of these, pop them around your manufacturing facility if you want and see like, oh, what does it make sense to measure here? So that's what these are. Pretty cool. And the Mango Yellow is not going to be available, though, until May 2019. Sad. Boo. And now... Kevin and I are going to share things that we have spent our own money on in the last few weeks. You spent more. I did. I spent a lot more. So I spent $99 on an Aware Glow. This is a really interesting product that I've actually been looking at this company. They used to make a bigger one. There's a new one coming. So the old one is being discounted. It was like $200. Now it looks like it might be on sale for about $150 if you get one. But you may not want to get one because there's a new one coming out. Or you can spend $99 and get the glow, which is what I did. It measures chemicals in the air, so VOCs in the air. It measures humidity, temperature, and also carbon dioxide. And I got it because I wanted to test the air quality in the portables in my daughter's school because she has classes in them and she says it's so hot and stuffy. And I was trying to get data to like understand how hot and stuffy, basically. And the school allowed that, which is awesome. They did. Now, I had a hard time connecting it to their network, their Wi-Fi network. So this is a Wi-Fi product, powered product. So you just pop it in. And the coolest thing is they have a pass-through plug. So you do take up an outlet when you plug this in, but you can plug other things in it, and it also acts as a smart plug. Even cooler is in the app, you can actually pick, like, if you plug in a fan or a humidifier or a dehumidifier, or in my case, uh, air purifier, you tell it what you've plugged in, and it will automatically turn that device on when it's needed. So if the temperature gets too high, and it knows there's a fan plugged into it, it'll automatically turn the fan on. I think that's awesome. That's this is, nice. This is basically, and this is good for anybody who's got, who like lives in a New York City apartment or has a a window air conditioning unit, you could actually take your old window air conditioning unit, plug it into this and tell it, hey, when the temperature gets above 90 degrees, turn the sucker on. Or if you don't want that to happen because it's hot, you're at work all day, you can also set schedules through this. So I think it's a really nice multi-use device. And I'm not 100% sure it does not tell me how many parts per million it's measuring for the VOCs. Mm, sure. And there's there's a lot of debate over how sensitive these really are, but it is very good for noticing trends, I think. So So I I have to ask. Tell me. What was the trend in the classroom? So because I had a hard time getting it on the Wi-Fi network, I never actually got in the classroom. Oh. But I can tell you, it's right now in my kitchen. When I cook, holy cow, I really should like ventilate. That is what I Well, yeah. Okay. I know. (laughs) Thank you. I can save you $99 and just tell you to do that. Fair. I should also say you can set preferences. This is kind of fun. It will tell you your air is bad with a little glowing light on the device, or it will also send you a notification if you allow it to. But you can set different priorities 
with, you basically tell the device, like allergies are important to me. So it will tell you it's a little bit more sensitive to humidity or chemicals. If you want productivity, carbon dioxide in the air becomes more Mm. critical. So I think it's a really fun product for $99. They've got a promotion right now going on spring 10. And then you get like 10% off, which again, not huge, but nice. Mm -hmm. You know, I like it. It's a smart plug that also tracks my air quality. What's not to love? Very nice. Oh, it works with a bunch of other devices like Madam A and I think Google Assistant. Hmm. So, hey. So I spent a whopping $2.99 for my Hey, big spender. Thing. Yeah, but I had to. I had to have this, and I'll tell you why. Because I couldn't believe it was true. Seriously. I found an app for my Apple Watch that apparently, allegedly, reportedly, puts Madam A on my wrist. I'm thinking, no way. Apple would never allow this. This can't work. Not possible. Sure enough, it works. I'm not going to say it works the way you would hope, and I'll explain why in a second, but it does work. So the name of the app is Voice in a Can, and maybe we can put a link in the show notes, not just maybe to the app in the App Store, but also to a video demo that the developer shows how it works. Basically, this is really clever. You open the app on your watch, and I have a complication on my watch that is a shortcut to it. So I have to tap the watch, obviously. And then I also have to tap the screen to tell the watch to start listening. So then I say my, I don't have to say Madame A, I just tap it. Then I say my command. That information, that sound bite is then sent to Amazon servers, just like any other Echo device. And she responds and does or does whatever I've commanded, you know, just like she would to an Echo. So there's a, a little bit of lag in terms of the back and forth communication and the fact that you have to tap the screen. But it does work, you know, and it's not an unbearable lag. I mean, it's just not as quick as using an actual Amazon product. So I'm impressed. It does what it says it does. And I did not think it would. That is rare in the world. (laughs) Yes, very true. And now it is time for our IoT podcast listener hotline. And guys and girls, We are still doing a giveaway. I am giving away my old Ecobee SI thermostat. So this is not the cool looking Ecobee that that kind of they launched in response to Nest, but it is a perfectly good connected thermostat that talks to Madame A and Google Assistant and has a lovely Ecobee app. So you'll you get all the benefits in just an older model thermostat. So That is what we are giving away. If you leave a voicemail at 512-623-7424. And this week's voicemail comes to us from Dan in Charlotte. Hi, Stacey and Kevin. This is Dan from Charlotte. I got to be honest, I am really struggling with smart lighting. You both know a lot about this space and Stacey in particular seems to be a smart lighting aficionado. I've thus far stayed away from smart bulbs because bulbs are expensive and they put the burden on my wife and young kids not to touch the wall switches. Since I'm a SmartThings user, I've already installed about five GE Smart switches around the house. And with my basic GE Smart switches, I can schedule lights to go on and off with SmartThings, and I can turn on and off groups of lights, for example, when we're going to bed. I am planning to add a bunch more switches, and so I wonder what I'm missing out on. Should I honestly consider smart bulbs? Would Lutron Cassetta for switches be much better for me than my GE switches? What else would I want to regularly do beyond my current GE Smart Switch features. Thanks very much for the recommendations. Oh, Dan, I kind of wish I knew a little bit more about your light switch, but we are going to guess that it is the GE Z-Wave, either the dimmer switch or the on-off switch. If it is the on-off switch, I'm going to recommend you go for dimmer switches. I am not going to recommend you go for bulbs unless you are doing like actual lamps. If you're doing lamps, then bulbs are perfectly acceptable. But in terms of getting more out of switches, if you are happy with those switches, then I say keep going. I will say my switch of choice is the Lutron Casetas, but only because with the Lutron Hub, they will work with HomeKit and a bunch of other platforms like Google, Madam A, SmartThings, Wink. They work Uh, with just about everything. Yes. So if that sort of like level of future proofing and interoperability is important to you, then yes, go for that. When you sell your house, I would recommend in that case, you sell the Lutron Caseta hub with it, and then they just can do with it what they want. With the current GE things, you probably, 
it's going to be hard to convince someone to use smart things. You know what I'm saying? It's a little tougher to play with. But those are really the only things. I mean, Kevin, can you think of things that he's missing out on by going or sticking with the GE, either dimmers? I would go with dimmers over the switch if you can. Right, because that way, see, I go the bulb route only because I do lamps more than overhead lights and such. And my family is trained that they'll get a small electric shock if they touch any switches in the house. I can't think of anything. The only other thing I would consider, and I don't know if the investment is worth it. We've talked about a couple of switches and light sets that will kind of create the scenes for you. Um, Oh, yeah. So things hmm? like noon. There we go. That's the one. Noon does, and and this is better for open floor plans. This is not good for like individual rooms, but if you install, and actually someone else will come out and install a bunch of noon switches for you, then they create, they have a lighting designer who's pre-configured a bunch of options like movie time. This is what all the lights should do during movie time. Some other things to think about, Lutron bought a company called Ketra that also does this. So we may see that coming to Lutron, maybe. I'm going to say maybe. It would be nice, but I'm not holding my breath. And then only other thing that you might want is there's a couple light switches that have like motion sensors. And Ecobee, for example, has a $99 light switch that has a motion sensor and Madam A built in. If that's appealing to you, it's pretty expensive if you're going to replace a bunch of them. I don't know if I'd go there, but you know, those do exist. And that could help solve the whole use the switch or not use the switch issue because you've got the motion sensor in there. Granted, you're paying a little more than two times the price of the GEs that you have, but, you know, plus you get Madame A, so, you know, it's an easy way to put an assistant in a room without buying another device itself, another standalone device. Like your bathroom. Don't you want her in your bathroom? No. Uh, no. (laughs) All right. Please order more Charmin. See? That's a perfect use case. Instant delivery, please. (laughs) I need a drone. Okay. (laughs) Potty humor. Who knew? Okay. The IoT Podcast Listener Hotline is brought to you by Schlage, maker of electronic locks. Schlage electronic locks can make life so much easier and more convenient. No more keeping track of extra house keys. Each member of your family can have their own access code. To see what's possible, visit schlage.com to learn more. And now, stay tuned for our guest... Anya Trabala with Synthbabe Records talking about how IoT can change music performance and how technology can really change the equation for artists. Stay tuned for that. But before we get there, let's hear a message from our sponsor, Praetorian. Praetorian provides end-to-end IoT security testing that helps organizations balance risk with time-to-market pressures. Praetorian engineers help you strengthen the security of your IoT products from chip to cloud. Turn security into your competitive advantage by earning a third-party certification from Praetorian, the leaders in IoT security. Microsoft has recognized Praetorian as best in class. So when you think Praetorian, think IoT security experts. Check out the case study online to see how Praetorian helps Samsung strengthen the security of its IoT platform by visiting stacyonioT.com slash security. That's stacyonioT.com slash security. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Hagenbotham, and today's guest is Anya Tribala, who performs as Nanoush. And every couple months, I like to bring someone who is an artist on the show to talk about how the Internet of Things and technology can transform art. And I ran into her at an event in Sweden, and I am super excited to have her come talk about everything that she's doing tied to AR, VR, connected suits, and maybe even the blockchain. So hi, Anya. How are you doing today? I'm good. We have some sun finally in Sweden, which is very exciting. Let's get this started. I saw you perform in this connected suit that created a virtual polar bear on stage at an event and you sang, you danced, the polar bear danced with you on the screen. (laughs) It was a really surreal and cool experience. So talk to me about that performance and how it all came together. 
Sure. Well, um, I've been working quite closely with Jayway, which is a digital media company here in Malmö. I'm originally from Melbourne in Australia, and we connected about a year ago at a conference they held. It was the first time I'd ever tried the glasses and the AR experiences, the HoloLens, all that kind of stuff, and I got super excited. And it's kind of been in the back of my mind to do something as an extension of the music that I produce. So we got in touch again about two months ago or something, and we had this amazing workshop, actually. And basically, we have all these amazing ideas that we want to try and do, but what's the one thing we can kind of work on right now? And they had just purchased this cool suit called the Rococo suit and basically I was like okay well maybe I can perform in this suit and we can project something we can you know create this kind of surreal experience so I I kind of looked into my into my songs and which song I wanted to perform with and sort of the song Palms came up which is quite a personal song to me it's where I wrote it just after my grandmother passed away and then when I sort of personally went into a really low state which is why I chose a polar bear as my avatar because I deal with bipolar disorder and kind of this my spirit animal So this polar bear was dancing in these different scenes on the screen while I was performing. So that's kind of how it came about. There was a really great team at Jayway that produced my vision, I suppose. So I gave them the concepts and they kind of morphed. We filmed in the snow. We filmed at a club gig that I performed at. And yeah, and this, this lovely experience came out. So you guys, I'll play a little snippet of the song for you, and I'll link to a video of parts of the performance in the show notes in case you want to see more. All right, so Anya, let's talk about you as an artist, what do you do? What do you focus on? And then we'll talk about how you think about bringing technology into that. I mean, I've always been a musician <laughs> since I was quite young. I played the trumpet for many years and then like moved more into choirs, into bands. And then now finally I'm producing my own music in a software called Ableton Live, which is a really intuitive piece of software actually, because you can pretty much orchestrate as many sounds and live loops and those kinds of things within the software. So my music, it can be quite emotive. I love technology. I think technology has a potential in a creative way to be really magical. So then let's talk about this suit, for example, that was using motion capture to create this VR experience. And you have this idea for a VR elevator that I think is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. This this idea, I think it kind of came about in this initial workshop we did with that dayway to create some sort of virtual space where you can like choose where you want to go. And this idea of an elevator came up in our workshop and I was like, wow, what if we could like create this virtual space so we can release music, we can have interviews, people can go in and try instruments in a virtual space. So, so, this, so I got really, really excited by <laughs> this whole idea it's something that we're actually working on. So we're working on the framework at the moment. And ideally, what I'd love to do is to release my album in the elevator. <laughs> if that makes sense, it's a little bit bit wild. So each floor could have its own song, I suppose. You can like choose and select and maybe at the top, there'd be like a interview going on or, but I mean, also my collective synth babes would facilitate all different and curate different floors because I have a lot of different artists that I work with as well so so that idea came out and it's like wow like you could have a whole festival in your living room pretty much when you're sitting on your couch and you just randomly pick a floor yes I mean I've just got these ideas I don't know how of course technically that's where Jayway would come in you know well, <laughs> that's where they might come in yeah and let's talk about working and we'll get to synth babes in a moment but let's talk about working with technology as an artist how do you I know that you're like oh I think this is neat how could I use it how much do you have to collaborate with partners and what do you look for in a partner yeah I mean, when it comes to the software, Ableton, I've been using it for about six years and I use it to sketch sounds and to sculpt sounds into different forms. So, for example, if I recorded some snow, like one of my songs, Snow Crunch, I actually recorded snow, you know, the steps you take on the snow and then transported that into Ableton and then messed around with it to make it sound like a song. That's stuff that I do 
just on my own and I love doing that. But I also really love collaborating with other musicians because they add so much texture and depth. So, for example, my friend Uni, she's a trumpet player, an incredible trumpet player. And when she played with me my last gig, you know, I would loop her trumpet while playing the live stuff so it creates this real texture and I think it also adds more instrumentation and a live feeling to electronic music which often people think you know it's technical it's very like maybe a little soulless in some ways or just doof techno banging music but actually it's kind of like having an orchestra in your computer that you just launch different sounds and and I just love I just love the sculpting of it and when you're thinking about doing like these VR worlds How do you think that collaboration works? Do you like sketch out the idea with someone or? Yeah, I mean, I I love the idea of using a lot of animation and a lot of different, you know, collaborating with artists in that way. A visual artist, I already have a few in mind, but then also commissioning other artists, other synth babes to create their own floor. So I think one thing with VR is the accessibility. Some people, a lot of people don't have them. So maybe it'd be cool to open up a space you know, like an arcade where you could come in and try these different different worlds. So let's go to this concept of the synth babes, because this is something you are passionate about, and it's beyond just you. So talk to me about what that is. Yeah, so I, I launched Synth Babe Records about two years ago. There was a editor of Pitchfork, Jessica Hopper, who I saw a keynote of, and she was just like, come on, girls, just go, go for it. Go for your business ideas, you know, because... Traditionally, the music industry is very male-dominated in terms of the the leadership structure. So I was like, hmm, I really want to create this collective, basically, of women and gender-diverse electronic music producers. And also, I wanted to release my own album through my own way. And that's always been the core, I think, is that sort of having the ownership of my music and not handing it over and not losing the copyright to it. And then it's kind of evolved into more of a collective, more of a startup, because I want it to have impact. I want it to change the electronic music scene because the representation is so low for women on the bigger scale. And I think one of the main issues is accessibility to expensive music software. I think, you know, there's a lot of gatekeepers that (laughs) don't book as many female artists because maybe they've just got different biases. I did some surveys about a year ago on how, on why, and those are the kind of reasons why. So I want to create this kind of very cool online space. With the funding you're trying to raise today, you guys are going to create this online space where people will have access to the discounted software? Yeah, kind of. I think I was really inspired by the conference and blockchain. (laughs) No, (laughs) you can't unsee blockchain now. Like I'm like, wow, this could revolutionize the way you do business. So basically, I was discussing this concept of offering up the software as a sort of you can borrow time, I suppose, on the software because software, music software, it takes a long time to learn. I mean, I had Ableton Live for six years before I actually bought it myself. (laughs) So this idea of like being able to share the software around and then just being charged with what you use, it's like, oh, that could be a really cool concept. You know, that could be a really cool idea where you could try it out and then you could purchase it. And I had this idea of, because cost was always such a thing that came up in my research as to why, like, you know, why you didn't buy the software. I'm like, well, you know, women on average earn less than men. Like that is a gender pay gap in the world. You know, women on average have more cost per month. So I'm thinking, hmm, maybe there's you know, some discounts we can offer the synth babes that do use the sort of platform. That's the kind of thinking that I want. And that's, for me, feels like it would create more impact. Got it. Okay. And then the other part of this, so after you've got the online space, you're also creating a festival, correct? Yes. It's super exciting. So we're actually going to Iceland June 30 to put on a conference, conference, a tech music feminist conference. And some of this money that we're raising will go towards that. And then we basically want to replicate that festival around different cities around the world. And yeah, just inspire and talk tech, basically, because yeah, I think women have really interesting ways of approaching technology and also maybe using it. So I think it has the potential to inspire, <laughs> basically. Got it. All right. And let's talk about the blockchain, because yes, when... <laughs> When we would, after the conference, when we went out to dinner, we were all very excited about blockchain. 
Yes, I know. <laughs> and then I keep talking about blockchain to everyone I meet. Have you thought of ways to use it in music that seem like they might work? Well, I know Imogen Heap. She's an amazing artist. She's working on like how to create transactions and also assess streaming costs. Because the way I see it, if since babes were to edit and have their own system on the blockchain, we can see exactly how many streams we get. We can see, ex- you know, if we put a release a track on a particular date, that won't change. Because right now, if I, you know, I'm with a distributor and if I take that down, then what happens to the song? Like, I just think the permanence of blockchain makes it very exciting because then you can really see exactly how many streams you get, how much money you are owed. That's what makes me excited. Okay, so more as a payments thing. Payment thing, but then also smart contracts as well. When you're working with artists, you know, you you want it to be as legitimate as possible. And sometimes, oh, where did I put that contract? You know, and that, that makes it quite exciting. And then that sort of software sharing system would be in the blockchain because, you know, you use it and then it's, it's there as a record. But those are the kind of things that I'm planning or thinking about. And going forward, how do you think that connectivity and technology will change how we experience music? Have you ever heard of a Humu pillow? It's like a, it's a AR, well, not AR, but like a pillow that is a Bluetooth pillow okay. and has a speaker in it. Okay. So when I was, because I presented at Slush last year, Slush Music, and they had this, you know, the displays and everything. And there's this amazing pillow. I think it's based in Finland where you just sit in the pillow and then you can watch a movie on your phone or you could potentially, you know, watch something or listen to music. But then listening to it, it's just got this vibration. So I think that has, like, entertainment, for one, will be a big change when people start to get all these cool little gadgets and experience music in a whole new way. But when it comes to performing, like the way I performed with the Rococo suit, I personally am trying to hack the audio (laughs) so I can use my audio system with this motion sensor suit. And when I move, then different effects and different, different sounds can come out just through my movements rather than me actually twiddling a knob maybe I can control the music with my body movements and I think that's really very very cool and something that I'm hoping to work on really soon I think it's kind of magic I think you know even stagecraft like microphones and microphone stands and things like that just seems so analog I think there'll be evolution with different products that you can use on stage that maybe didn't exist like 10 years ago oh so like we ditch the microphone and we go for something different Yeah, I have this idea of a microphone, like a drone microphone. So you could kind of follow you and you don't have to actually hold the microphone because I feel like when you hold the microphone, it can deter your whole performance. I know Kate Bush was one of the first people to request a headset mic Uh in one of her performances. She was one of the first people to do that. And I just have this idea of like a microphone that could maybe could float in front of your face or something, you know, and you can sing into it. And then, like I said about the elevator project, like personal entertainment at home, feeling like you're actually somewhere. And that gives access to a lot more people, not just the people that experience it live, but, you know, could be thousands, it could be millions. And then through a blockchain system, you can actually monetize that. So, and that gets to a big challenge is right now, it feels like the world for artists is both wide open with crowdfunding type opportunities and Patreon and other sites. Yes, yes. There's a lot of disruption happening because I think old music industry models aren't working. And I think artists have the potential to really reclaim their independence and not be so exploited. That's what I'm hoping to do with Tint Babes is to be able to fund all the creative projects that we want to do and not operate like a like a not for profit or something. Actually, not to operate on a business with business models, but with a social cause. You know, I think that's very powerful when that happens. Okay, well, Anya, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week.